gonna talk for us today, he ought to be like Christ. I hope everyone's answer is yes to be able to start. Hi everyone. Um, so, welcome. Um, for those who weren't here last week, so Sylvie and I decided to do a bit of a book series. So the actual talk today and last week are based on this book, so we're going to be like Christ. Um, Eight Essentials to Get You There by Charles Sumo. Highly recommended read. Um, I'm probably not going to be able to do it justice in the next hour or so, and I'm probably not going to try to. But I will go into some, I basically picked one area that I'm going to delve into. But um, happy to talk about this afterwards because I didn't really think it's worth your while. And it's a very easy read, so it's written really well and very kind of easy to digest. So if everyone's looking for a book to pick up, pick one. So maybe we can dive straight in. So who would like to read? So you don't listen to my voice for the next hour. <laughs> Three. <laughs> Since you made the grimacing face with my voice. <laughs> Go on. <clears throat> Well, my present purpose is that I may know him, that I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, receiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly, and that I may in that same way come to know the power outflowing from his resurrection, which it exerts over believers, and that I may so share his sufferings as to be continually transformed in spirit into his likeness, even to his death. And I actually forgot to put the reference there, but that's... Which translation is that? Huh? Which translation? A and P. Um, exactly. Look at this one. So who, wh where is this from? <laughs> St. Paul. Yes, in Philippians, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> also. Uh, oh, always a star student. Um, so basically, this is the purpose of the whole book. So the way that Charles Wendell writes, all the essentials are what he calls disciplines, is with this intended purpose. And the beautiful thing about this, I guess, is probably because sometimes we ask a very simple question of like, what is the meaning of life? What am I doing here? What am I supposed to be doing with my time? This is a really nice and safe way to think about it. And not only that, but he reminds you of that in every single chapter. So at the beginning of the chapter, he'll say, this is why we're here. At the end of the chapter, he'll say, this is why we're here. And what that does is it also kind of center you when you're reading it, I guess, the purpose of what you're trying to understand and digest for yourself. So I think it's a really powerful way to think about what we should be doing here. Um, and I won't delve into too much detail on this, but just to give you a bit of a, I guess, a, a flavor of what the book is about. So what he then does is he basically creates these eight spiritual disciplines. Now he does say that these eight, there's probably more, but he picked these eight because he feels like they make a lot of sense in terms of the combination. So the first one is intimacy, deep in our lives, and actually Sylvia last week spoke about intimacy. Um, I know we didn't record it sadly, but I do have the PowerPoint if you want to interesting um, to look into that. Simplicity, which is decluttering our mind, so how do we take the noise out? Silence and solitude, slowing our pace. Um, I will be focusing on this one today because it's a personal struggle, a very big personal struggle. Um, but also something that resonated with me, especially kind of this past year and what I've been going through. So I'll talk about it. Uh, the fourth one, surrender, so releasing our grip. <laughs> also a very difficult one. Fifth one is prayer, so calling out, so how do we pray for that? Um, humility, bowing low, so actually really putting ourselves beneath everyone else and kind of try to live a very humble life. Uh, self control, holding back. So all our wonderful sins that we don't like to stare at, but we all know are there. Uh, and then sacrifice, giving over. The beautiful thing about how he structures it is basically one to four, he talks about the emptying of ourselves, and then five to eight is the filling. So in order to prepare ourselves for the prayer of humility, self-control, sacrifice, we need to be able to have intimacy, simplicity, silence, and surrender. So that's just a very brief summary. Um, again, recommend you read the whole book. But for today, as I said, we're going to focus on silence and solitude. Context before we jump in. Um, I did spend the first half of this year traveling on my own. And I did a lot of silence and solitude. And I have to say, I think before I did that, I probably wouldn't have been prepared to talk about this today. 
particularly because how we think of science and solitude, unless you fully experience it. And this is what I want everyone to try and do today, is to really think about what that means and to put the effort into experiencing it. I think the benefit of it is probably not as great. So to put our words into action, I'm going to ask all of us to close our eyes. Put away anything in your hands, get comfortable for a second. Jamie is the only one who's not allowed to do this, okay? <laughs> okay, so yeah, get comfortable in your seats and I want you to close your eyes. And we're just gonna sit in silence for five minutes. Five minutes? Five minutes. <laughs> interesting how like very different thoughts just came from everywhere. Very different thoughts came from everywhere. Yes. Yeah. Girls in the back who decided not to participate. Why can you stay silent? I actually can't. It's one of my things. I feel like I just I wake up in the morning and I have my sister's side. So I just speak to them. Okay. I just speak to anyone. Like if I don't have my headphones, I just speak to them in the day. Just hard to do it. No, and I appreciate the honesty, but that's exactly why I'm asking. Because some people genuinely struggle to stay silent. It's not easy to do, as you would have noticed. It's not comfortable. Sometimes it's boring. Sometimes it makes you feel restless. It's not a natural state or something that we're encouraged. What about all the noises you've heard around you? It makes you want to open your eyes, right? And be like, what's going on? So silence is not something that is natural to us. By that I mean today, in this world. I don't mean in general. It's really interesting because me sitting and watching, like the fidgetiness and like the restlessness and the fact that people want to do something or they open their eyes or they are talking or... Some people were able to sit in silence. So I guess the people who appreciated it more, why do you think you were able to do that? Uh, something I try to do every now and then. I don't, I'm always successful, but it's something I always want to do for. Yeah. And whenever I do do it, I feel better. So, so, I think, for me, silence is not just about the external environment. I actually think that's probably something we can, if we learn how to sit in silence, can probably, silence is more about silencing ourselves to sit still. 
It's not easy. And I think often we tell ourselves, I'm incapable. But I actually don't think that's true. I think we just haven't tried it and genuinely tried to understand the benefit of what silence gives you. I think we live in a world where having silence is almost impossible sometimes. Whether it's your phone vibrating, whether it's things around you in your home or outside in the road, or whether you listen to music, or whether you're talking to your friends or your family, like it's not a it's not something that's easy to come by. If I had to ask you what are the most silent moments in your life, what would you say? Where do you experience silence the most? Sleep. Sleep. But are you even experiencing it then? <laughs> so when you are conscious, at what point do you have your most silent moments? When I'm eating. Huh? When I'm eating. When you're eating? Okay. Because <laughs> then you can't talk. <laughs> There's one here, Alicia was saying, in oh. nature. In nature. Beautiful example. Um, so this is why I put this, because I think sometimes you can have noise outside, like in nature. And it's, that's not really the problem. The problem is inside of us to stay silent. To be able to be <coughs> still. Who knows this first? What do you think it means when it says to be still? Like just stand in one place? To be calm. To be calm. Yeah. To not be anxious. To not be anxious. Stop the anxiousness. Yeah? Marina? So this is basically a commandment. It's a commandment that asks us to be still and to know that I am God. How many people think they are able to do this in their life? <laughs> Has anyone tried? Yeah? How do you find that? It's not easy. No. Why is it not easy? Because you think you know that. I think there's also, when we do try that, we have to not try it in the way that Eastern teachings do, which is to empty yourself. No, that's not Christian. We do it by focusing on Him to know that He is God. So not emptying, but our silence is to focus on Him, to put Him before us, to have Him speak but not full emptiness, that would be. We can give another talk on those kind of teachings that open us up to uh, spiritual attacks. But, yeah. A really, really good point, actually, because I guess for me, I used to confuse that. I used to confuse those two concepts. And it isn't about emptiness of the self. Spoiler alert, it's about more of the listening. 
And I'll, t I'll, I'll go into what that means in a bit more detail because when we say listen, so Antoine made a really good point. When you sit in silence, you watch your thoughts. But you get a lot of thoughts, actually. There's a lot that comes into your mind. The thing about thoughts is that they're not fixed. They're not ideas that actually are factual. They are things that are created through a series of experiences in a day in your life, in your culture, in your background. They say something crazy like, I don't know, you have tens of thousands of thoughts in a day. So when you're sitting there and you're actually listening to what your thoughts have to say, the reason it can be boring is because we like to be entertained. And to sit with yourself means that you're going to discover something about yourself. That's a very difficult thing to do sometimes because for me, when I do that, or at least when I started doing that, you see a lot of things about yourself you don't necessarily like. And that requires a level of patience to really get why is it that you're running away from looking at them. And that's not something that happens in a day, in a week, in a month. That's like your whole life that you're building now. And I feel like the I know that I am God piece can only happen when you also start to understand yourself. I feel like we spend a lot of time distracting ourselves and doing things so that we don't have to think and we don't have to worry and we want to numb our anxiety and we don't want to think about stuff so we just pick up our phone and we go on social media or we go and talk to someone or we find a way to distract ourselves because the discomfort of sitting with ourselves and our thoughts is not easy. Even putting music on. I love music. Like, I love waking up and putting music on in the morning. But I also know music is really powerful and it changes the way that I feel. So if I'm in a bad mood and I put a happy song, it's gonna make me feel better. But what it doesn't let me do is think about why I feel bad and how do I fix that. So this idea of being still is so important, I cannot tell you. I genuinely feel like if you want to have a relationship with God and you want to build a spiritual depth with Him, you have to have the silence with Him. Yes, at the beginning that's difficult, and I do think if you really struggle with that, there are things you can do, whether it's like reading or listening to sermons and finding ways to focus your attention on Him. Well, what I really want us to get to is just to sit still. Even if it's for 10 minutes. Because I honestly think what you get as a result of that, none of this will do it justice. And it's really interesting because in the book he says, you know, I can't fully explain it. It's a mystery that when you sit alone with God and you talk to him in your thoughts, in your heart, he reveals himself to you. And I don't mean like he talks to you, but he will show you things because you're giving him the space. And I don't think we give God space in our life in the way that he is asking from us. I think we run to him when we have problems. We come on a Sunday because it's part of our ritual. We do the tick box exercises that we're always been told to do about reading the Bible and doing our verses, but genuinely sitting in silence with him with no distractions. <clears throat> I think what you will learn about yourself in that process is quite a, it's a difficult thing, but it's one that's really fruitful. So that's a bit about silence. If silence has a mate, it must be solitary. <laughs> they go together really well. I think you can have solitude outside of silence, but I think silence helps you get to the point of real solitude. So it's not a precondition for you to be silent in order to have solitude. You can actually also have solitude in yourself in the midst of chaos. The best example I can think of is Book Barobas. If you haven't read the book, The Silent Patriarch, it's fantastic. It's really, he is the epitome of an example, or at least a more modern day example, of what it means to have that type of, they call them urban hermits, which is this idea that you can live in complete noise and chaos, but still be able to attain a form of solitude. But I think in order to attain the solitude, the silence helps you
<clears throat> Who would like to read? Hi. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. And because so many people were coming and going, they did not even have the chance to eat. He said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. Why do you think Jesus asked them to do that? So context here is they basically just fed 5,000. There's a lot of high and energy and they witness this miracle and it's all amazing. I imagine when you've just seen something so good, like can you imagine how much like energy and things are just like flooding inside you? You probably want to talk about it. You want to be like, oh my God, how amazing was that? Did you all see what just happened? Like this stuff that you want to do and say. But Jesus told them to go somewhere quiet. Why did he do that? Excited, or they, some of them might feel a bit boastful about what happened. That oh, we did this amazing miracle, and maybe he wanted to give them that chance to, I guess, thank God for what happened. Other thoughts? I think just knows they need that after the days were very busy, as they put it. So as, as a form of reprieve? Just because they need it, so he's providing that for them. Why do you think they need it? Because they might, I don't know, maybe they're too busy to like be with him and to just connect with him. to renew us to remind us that he's the source. Absolutely. So there's a really nice quote that I read which said, solitude bears the same relation to the mind that sleep does to the body. It affords it the necessary opportunities for repose and recovery. Mm -hmm. Now the beautiful thing about this, if you take that quote plus who they were with, which is Christ. It's a form of recovery and recompense. It's the idea that it helps you refill yourself. That's a really scary thought for me personally. Because we've, I've been living on this earth now, 33 years old. Yeah. I have not given myself the opportunity to recover. So if I spend all of my time surrounded by people, working, doing things with family, serving, friends, traveling, whatever it is, and I'm not investing in the thing that actually replenishes my soul and my mind, how are we surviving? Like, it really was a bit of a, I am a very active person, I really care about my health, and I do put a lot of energy and time into doing like exercise. But when it comes to the mind, we don't actually replenish it properly. We just distract it. We replace it with something else. We go into another activity or another person. Or even people say to me, oh, but it's nice because if I have to talk through my problems, it makes me feel better. No. Like, yes, there is a point for that. But also, where is the point at which you say, I'm going to replenish my mind for myself? And we're not talking about the emptying of the self. We're talking about the replenishing and having a relationship with God where you sit in silence with him. How we don't do this, it's no wonder we're anxious. We'll get to that. There's different ways of doing it, but we'll get to that. I think the point here is Christ knows that we need solitude. Even before his ministry, he spent 40 days in the desert. And I think 
He knows what that does to you because even solitude can help you prepare. If you're about to face something, you've got an obstacle or a difficult situation, and you sit in solitude and silence, and you prepare yourself for that, that makes you stronger. There's something about how we structure our lives in a way where we don't leave enough room for this, or the kind of taking a step back. Our natural instinct is wanting to fix them. It's to jump straight in, it's to figure out what we're gonna do about it, who do we need to talk to, and I'm the first person. Like, this is me talking about myself. When I have a problem, my instinct is just to over-critically analyze all of it and think about everything that I need to think about and the solutions and I test it with people. This idea of taking a step back is really the healthiest and most pragmatic thing that you can do. Because what you do is you start to remove the noise from your mind and you sit down and you start to think clearer. Even if you do it 10-15 minutes a day, I don't think this is something that's gonna happen if you decide tomorrow to sit down by yourself for 15 minutes and you're gonna get all the answers to life because that would be fantastic, but that's not how this works. But it's the idea about how do we, how do we structure ourselves or how do we live a life where we allow room for this? So I said earlier, I spent basically the first five months of this year just traveling. That was a scary thing to do because everything I'd known, I basically decided I wasn't gonna do it the same way anymore. And I was gonna take a step back from all the things that were in my mind. I don't have all the answers, not even by any means of a stretch. But I have more clarity. Because I could mute my thoughts in the sense that I was physically out of an environment that I was thinking about all the time. But it also meant that just getting the distance from it when I was then represented with the exact same information, like nothing had changed, my view of the problem had changed. The way I tackled the problem had changed. And without that distance, which is what I have been doing for a very long time, <coughs> you're just running around in circles sometimes. And I'm not saying, and I know it's a privilege, and I had that privilege, I could go away for that period of time. We don't all have that privilege, for many reasons. But imagine if you were to exercise it for 10, 15 minutes every day, in the morning, in the afternoon, to give yourself the space to think. It really changes how we actually see the world. There's a really nice, another quote that I picked up, or two actually, which says, if you don't come apart, you will come apart. And it really hit me, and he wrote it in the book, and as soon as I read that, I was like, that's so true. I think sometimes it feels scary to come apart because you feel maybe disconnected or that you're like not in touch with what's going on. But actually, it, it helps you more than you think it does. There is a different point here about you don't live in complete solitude because I do think community is important and there's a balance between those two things. But actually, they feed each other. Because if you don't have solitude, you can't bring your best self to a community. And if you don't have community, then you probably end up being more depressed and in your thoughts and probably thinking you're right about everything. So there's a balance between those two things. But I think for today, it's just more about, I know we have a beautiful community and it's nourished and it's amazing and we get to come here every Sunday. But I feel like, especially in a place like London, this is something probably that's missing more than the community side. Any reflections on that? Ron Mel described the newsman's encounter this way. 
So somehow, all of his standard approaches and formula questions were inadequate for the task. And the little nun from Calcutta, sitting beside him so sweetly and tranquilly, didn't seem inclined to make it much easier. When you pray, asked Rather, what do you say to God? I don't say anything, she replied. I listen. Rather tried another tact. Well, okay. When God speaks to you then, what does he say? He doesn't say anything. He listens. <laughs> Rather looked bewildered. For an instant, he didn't know what to say. And if you don't understand that, Mother Teresa added, I can't explain it to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, such few and succinct words. I can't even tell you what she fully means by that. And the reason that I know I can't tell you what she fully means by that is because I haven't spent enough time with God just listening. There is no answer here. Like, there's not a, like, a, what do I do or how I do it. It's you just need to sit down and try. And this idea of how he reveals himself to you in that process, because your heart is open to that process, I think really God reveals a lot. This idea of listening, for me, translates to listening to my thoughts, listening to what some call a small little voice, which we'll get to that in a minute. But even just sitting with yourself, you don't have to say anything. Like, I feel like we always feel like we want to be reacting to something. The idea is just to be in existence. Like, literally to be. That sounds weird, doesn't it? Like, how can I just sit still and do nothing and not think and not talk and not want to say something? But this is the kind of, the place we need to start getting to. Because if we can find a way to do that, I think what then fills us becomes a very different and I think it reveals itself in a very different way. But like I said, I can't really give you an exact answer. I think it's something we have to experience. And if you're serious about it, you will experience it. But I just thought that was a really beautiful way of capturing it because she had a beautiful relationship with God. And I think this idea of listening is, is a difficult one. But I would say be patient. Like, give it time. beautiful and I think it's really important and you're right it's really hard but I think what even when you're speaking it's because you have been building a relationship with God I think the difficulty of sitting silent sometimes is because you don't have these things to draw from and it sparks a really good thought actually because if you struggle with that and your mind really is just going on another level and you're, you're finding it too hard then reading something so reading especially the Bible is the first word of call like sit down with the word of God and meditate on it so for some people, that's not easy, and I get that. So listen to a sermon if you're more audible. Um, read a book if you prefer. But like, try to fill your mind with the thoughts of what it means to be present and to understand Christ. So that when you are sitting in these moments sometimes and you're struggling, you also have some references to pull from. 
Um, so the mixing and the anxiety of it sometimes is too much. But when you have that relationship and you continue to cultivate it, this becomes so much easier. But it's a relationship and it's a process. It's not something that you just do. It's something you have to experience. And I do feel like that's our lifelong journey. And no matter how busy or cluttered or distracted or anxious or whatever we are, if you can manage that solitude and the silence with him, even in that chaos, like you have peace. And in further chapters, which is really beautiful, even just in terms of prayer and how we use that as a powerful tool, like also talk to God. So if you do want to talk, talk. Really, like I don't think there's a, there's a, there's no right way of doing this. But I want us to get to this point. So, right, do what works for you. But ultimately get to a point where we can actually listen. And in order to do that, hearing your thoughts and understanding and just being present, it gives you space. It's a very difficult thing to do, but you can do it. I guess it, you might not have a right answer, but how would you know if you're hearing it right? Is there like a... <laughs> is, yeah. I can only speak from my experience. I think if it feels uncomfortable in the beginning, you're definitely doing it right. If you're bored, you're definitely doing it right. If you want to pick up your phone, you're definitely doing it right. Like, I mean in the sense that all these distractions and the uh, like discomfort of doing that, that's, it means you're doing it right. If you feel comfortable with the whole process, if you are picking up your phone in the mid-between to like check something and come back to it, and you don't find the discomfort in it, I think there's, it's not working, in my personal opinion. And then over time, it's being able to sit still and just hearing it. And I think that if you get to a point where you can start to do that, you also realize how time passes without you even realizing how much time has passed. So I think at the beginning, you're counting the minutes. But as you get further into it, it becomes easier to give more time. So I don't, I don't have a perfect answer. That's been my personal experience. So I don't know if anyone else wants to share anything. start sitting in silence, I'm really anxious because my mind's distracted, but I think when you walk away feeling a bit more peaceful and calm, then I think you kind of have an answer there. Who wants to read it? Uh -huh. I can't see. Alicia? If we possess a most solitude, we do not fear being alone, for we know that we are not alone. <coughs> Neither do we fear being with others, for they do not control us. In the midst of noise and confusion, we are settled into a deep inner silence. Whether alone or among people, we always carry with us a portable sanctuary of the heart. I really like that last bit. It's a portable sanctuary of the heart. So this is a quote from a book by Richard Foster called The Spiritual Disciplines, another really great book for this topic. Richard Foster sometimes links silence and solitude as a first step with journaling. So get a Bible verse, meditate on it, focus on it, and then get your pencil out, pen and paper, your best journal where you put your diary entries in. And train yourself to see what God is telling you about this verse. Gradually we become, it becomes easier to hear God and to write down your thoughts. And you build that relationship of being able to hear him and understand what he's saying. 
So there's the link between that book. Great spoiler alert as well. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, it's perfect. It's perfect. Um, journaling is fantastic um, and something I would encourage everyone to do. So this question of what will I hear? So I really like this. Um, this verse where it says a still small voice. Do we, yeah, do the context, please, Sharif. <laughs> uh, so this is Elijah just after he uh, killed all the prophets of Baal, and he realized that he was in danger from Jezebel, so he ran away, mm -hmm. and he hid in a cave. And uh, he, God came to him and said, what are you doing here? Basically, <laughs> God, uh, he said, um, I'm the only one left, so I, I ran away and I hid. And, uh, what will what will be now? And there was a discussion about God appearing to him, so he, he went up and stood at the cave, and then there was wind, fire, earthquake, but God was not in all of this, and then there was a still, small voice. That's God. Thank you. So it's a really beautiful story. I like it. I really like this, um, especially because it wasn't grand. It was a still small voice. Now the main difference here is that Elijah did speak to God <laughs> because he is a prophet. But I also think that has to do with time. Like we don't need any more information. We have a Bible filled with everything that tells us what we need to do. This still small voice is the thing that we're trying to hear in our lives. And I really feel like we have so many things at our fingertips in terms of understanding what it is that God wants from us, how we should live Christian lives, how we have the humility, the love, the peace to be Christ-like. Like we're not, we're not missing information. I think in my personal experience, it's usually will and discipline. So. I would want to do something, but then I don't have the discipline to do it. I don't have the discipline to do it consistently. And then I ask questions like, oh, well, what's God's will for me? If I actually spent the time talking to him and building a relationship with him, these things become clearer. So the idea here really is we want to get to a point where we can hear this still small voice. And how we can really start to embed that into our lives. In the everyday and not just on the Sunday, because we're here for a nice talk. Um, but trying to find the solitude and the silence to be able to hear that. And I said it before and I'll say it again, it's not easy. But like, let's not quit before we start. Like we say it's too hard and it's too complicated. But realistically, it's something we, we can and are more than capable of doing. I think we just choose to say it's too difficult because we don't want to sit on our own. So I think it's really important that we try to remember and prioritize this. I think if we can find the stillness in our lives with the solitude, I think the small voice will become a bit bigger. And we won't have to fight so hard to hear it all the time. But it really does start with us. So I know probably it's different from person to person, but like how much of the listening is like in content context of my thoughts? Like I have my thoughts, do I try to dismiss them and like listen to what else God's talking about? Or do I present them to him and have like what does he say in context of these things? So I think in the first instance, and I have sure you feel free to jump in, like we don't have to do anything. I just want you to listen to your thoughts. Like it's not about rejecting them, it's not about pushing them away. I think it's just about understanding. Like I think before we know, at least for me, in order for me to know what I need to do, I need to understand what it is I'm doing. And I feel like in my personal experience where I sit with my thoughts, even if I observe the thoughts that I have, I start to understand like where my mind is distracted or why it's distracted or what the problem is that I'm facing. I think then at some point you then say, okay, I can put this forward to God because I don't know how to fix this. But I'm telling you, in, in a span of 15 minutes, the number of thoughts you're going to have, at least for me, they're not even related. They're just like random. 
They're random concoctions of anxieties, conversations, things I need to do, like something that's in front of me that's distracted me. They're just all random things. So I don't even, I'm, I don't even know what I'm presenting to God because they're just a combination of stuff. So for me, the listing that is just the more the sitting in silence and just seeing what's actually happening. And I think early to the point there, at some point you get into a different level of depth with yourself once the noise starts to seep out. I think then you start to think about different things, at least for me. So I would say in the first instance, just try it and see where you get to. I don't think there's like a path or amazing way of doing this getting to an answer. I think it's more about learning about yourself and then learning about how yourself can be in a relationship with God. But I don't know if I have to answer that. I think from what well, I struggle also with a lot of thoughts, especially when I start to bombarded with work, with family, with service, with you know, anything that's going on around me that goes through. But the key thing that I've learned is make sure that there is there is nothing going on around you. So if you have a window or if you have something, a door, close. Close that. And even the Bible tells us, go into your inner room, close the door. And then you, you will have your prayer time. So close everything and then I start talking. Like any thought that comes to me, I start talking, even sometimes out loud, I say, I don't understand, why did this happen? Okay, why did you let me do this? You know, this, this felt like, you know, not, not me. Or this guy did this, and I'm really, really angry about this. And I just keep on talking, talking. There's gonna come a point in time when you're just gonna, you've offloaded all of that, all of these thoughts, and then it's gonna become quiet. The key thing here is, do not expect God to speak every time. Because if you do have that expectation, you're going to be very disappointed. <clears throat> you're not going to listen every time. But there are times when you're going to get you're going to get these like grace visitations that are called great, and the fathers call them grace visitations, where you're just going to find yourself, you know, flying up above anything else. And that doesn't happen often. But this, these are times when you know that still small voice that takes you to, to another to another level. And there is no right or wrong formula, but this is all experience, and you just have to keep on learning. Yeah. But that, that's, that's what I do. Yeah. 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 Can you read that, or are you still blocked? Oh, it's still blocked. <laughs> <laughs> For in the seclusion of a cell, an existence whose quietness is only varied by the silent meals, the solemnity of ritual and long solitary walks in the woods, the troubled waters of the mind grow still and clear, and much that is hidden away and all that clouds it floats to the surface and can be skimmed away, and after a time one reaches a state of peace that is unthought of in the ordinary world. This idea that at certain points you do feel like you are in such a state of peace. And I also really like this idea of peace that is unthought of in the ordinary world. We don't often think about these things. And I also don't think in the ordinary world you can experience that kind of peace. Because I think the peace that we're talking about here is the depth in the self. It's not the peace of things outside of you. And the only way to attain that is if you remove yourself from the ordinary world enough to be in silence and solitude. For me, the definitions cannot coexist insofar as to be able to experience that level, you really have to remove yourself. And then you can bring that to the world, but you can't attain it in that context. And that's why I think this is so important for us to really just to build that into our daily ritual so that we can start to build what we think that piece is. Because I promise you, the more you do it, all your problems become so much smaller. I think for me, when I sit in that silence, it really makes it more manageable. Everything just feels so small in comparison to the greatness of God. Yeah. Yeah. So how to cultivate? I kept it very simple. Three things. Find 15 minutes in the day to be silent. Just 15 minutes. You can do it in the morning when you first wake up. Don't look at your phone. Just sit in your bed. 
If you want to take it to the next level, kneel down and pray. If you can't do it then, shower, car, wherever. Find a place where you're not distracting yourself with anything just to be silent. Preferably, it would be nice in your room with the door closed and you are doing that, but if you're struggling with that, then find it in different ways. Like really try to <coughs> sit in <inside. coughs> Preserve what you discover. So this to me is journaling. Write it down. Does anybody in the room journal? Yeah, your hands? Best thing you can do. Best thing you can do. Journaling is not like writing something that someone's gonna see. The beautiful thing about journaling is you just take what's in your head and you put it down on paper. And if at any point in time you go back and you start to read it again, it's so fascinating to read what you've written because you honestly don't even realize half the time. But especially when you're going through these 15 minutes at the beginning, if you're struggling to sit still, write. It's one of the most therapeutic things you can do in the world in general, let alone when you're actually trying to do this particular exercise. And finally, make it a habit. Like, don't just start and then stop. Like, really, let's try to build this into day-to-day. -day. I think the clarity you'll get as a consequence, I can't convince you. Like, you'll have to try it yourself. And I, if you do it long enough and come back to me and tell me Tina's not working, I probably won't believe you. <laughs> because I know, without a doubt, this is definitely gonna work. But you just need to put the effort in. So, three things. Find 15 minutes. Find a way to remember what it is you're learning and just make it every day. Finally, close with one verse. Toby, you want to read this verse? Alone and quiet in that place of stillness and solitude, where we protect and guard our hearts with all diligence from the clamor of the world that will pollute it. God will lead us to springs of life bubbling from somewhere deep within. And the beautiful thing about this quote is that it is within. We all have the capacity to be able to live a life that is close to God. We just have to find a way to ignite that in ourselves. I think if we don't really encourage ourselves to find that place with Him, it, the rest for me almost seems futile, if I'm honest. It feels like it's wasted energy. But keep trying. Don't give up on this process. Like I said, it's not easy. But I would really, really implore all of you to try and experience this um, and to start to build a very personal relationship with him in the sense. Any questions? Uh, what are your thoughts on like meditation? Considering it's like a very simple concept to sit down. Yeah, we, we'll, we'll, we'll do some talk, we'll do a talk on um, the difference between what the world sometimes teaches, and one of those things is Eastern meditation, self-emptying, that's not what we do. We do focusing on Him. The difference between Eastern teaching is that you empty yourself and you become part of the, um, the Nirvana, the all-encompassing that's not what Christianity teaches. Christianity teaches the importance of God recognizing who you are. Your individual identity is not going to be scrubbed out, but your goal is to sit and focus on Him so that He can speak to you. But at no point is He going to wipe out your individualness. That's something very precious to Him. In Eastern thought, you become part and you melt away into nothing. And the Lord says... Uh, a small parable he says and when the seven demon when the demons have been cast out they come back and they find the places empty and clean and so they rush back in they invite their friends over mm -hmm. so the danger is not to empty ourselves but to fill ourselves with Christ mm -hmm. so don't get into that focus of the Eastern Orthodox teaching Eastern um, my mystical teaching of the Buddhists and, and things we're supposed to fill our hearts with him not the other way around so basically, what, are you saying that when it comes to that quiet time with God, that it's it's quite time with God, as opposed to um, one size fits all? I like the idea that it's subjective. We make Him the subject of our time. Yes. <laughs> nice. That's a bar. <laughs> 
Like I said, I think there's maybe the distinction to make here is when we say to sit in silence and to quiet in our minds, I think it's to the point about you have a lot of clutter and noise, and the idea is that we're trying to silence that. It's not muting our conversation with him, but we're trying to silence everything that keeps us noisy, that then allows us the space to talk to God. And the listening of that can also mean just sitting there and thinking through some of that. But I think having the Bible in front of you, if you struggle with that on that level, is the perfect antidote for all of this. So when we say meditation, meditate on a verse. Look at one, but you can sit and probably unpick one verse for hours. I mean, people have spent their entire careers doing that. Scholars have done that with the Bible for centuries, right? So we're not short of content to, to meditate on. Um, but I think especially at the beginning, if you're struggling with that, having the Bible in front of you is, is the perfect answer. Any other questions, thoughts? Can we, can we do some watch outs? Yes. Because it's, uh, I think the three points are great, but there's there's things that will be, we, can, we can easily fall into. Uh, when we are like trying to make this a habit, uh, try to fix a time. Because what you're going to say is, oh, I'm just going to you know, find, find a time in the day. And what you're going to find is that there is not going to be a time in the day. Time is just going to pass by very quickly. And then you're going to come at the end of the day, oh, okay, I couldn't do it today, tomorrow. Maybe in the morning or maybe in the afternoon, not fix a time. It's very important that we do fix a time and dedicate the time. Secondly, do not take anything with you <laughs> inside <laughs> that place. Because you're going to be distracted very quickly and the devil will try to phones no watches, phones yes. yeah no phones no watches <laughs> nothing nothing take apart nothing. From. yeah apart from the bible <laughs> uh, just just try try to do these and it's very you you say well this is this is obvious but actually we fall into it very quickly we fall into it. and the third thing is once you've started going into the decluttering removing all of these thoughts you will feel that that's it, I'm done. <laughs> okay, my 15 minutes are over, now I can go out. That's just the beginning of your 15 minutes there, starting. That's true. Yeah, so don't fall into that mistake. Because really, really good point. Yeah. So I'm, I'm stating the obvious, but no, you, no, you, will, you, will, you will go into that. For sure. I think I started off being like, okay, mine's declared, I'm done now. Yeah. <laughs> but no, that's actually when you don't get anything out of it. Yeah, you don't, you don't, you're not filled at that point. You're just, yeah, happy, but very helpful. Do you want to say something? <laughs> you oh, no, I was just, I was just going to ask for suggestions of, you know, good times to do it in your experience, personal experience. Like, good times <clears throat> I think that's quite subjective yeah. because I think it depends on your circumstances. It depends on when you're best focused and half the time. Um, it's funny because actually when I was abroad, it was the morning always. I would wake up super early and I'd get the time to it because I had the time. Since I've been back and I started working again, it's the evenings. Because first thing in the morning, it's like I get out of bed and I'm rushed and I'm like, I have to go to work, I have to do this, I have to do that. And I don't necessarily like it, I have to say. Like I'm trying to rejig it around now because when you do it in the morning, for me, it sets the tone, personally. It allows me to focus on the right thing, that whatever my day is then presented with, I have something to draw from. If you do it at the end, it's you are kind of exhausted as well and you do feel like you have to put more energy into paying attention and not, like the decluttering takes longer. So personally, it's, I prefer morning where I found challenges, I try to move things around. Any other thoughts, questions? Say that again, In the first instance. I mean, there's room to do it with others, but your relationship is with God. Like, I think we have a lot of spaces already where we do prayer, worship, guidance with people. So I would say you're absolutely welcome to do it on top of time alone with God. But I think it also needs to be just you and him. Oh, for the other person. 
I mean, absolutely. Especially if it's a, if someone's going through a very new spiritual journey, there's probably a lot of other things that are kind of need to be prioritized and learned and understood. And I also feel like it's something that someone has to want to do themselves. Like I don't think someone's told to do it and then they're forced into it. It has to be a choice. Because I think if it's not a choice, then it becomes a different experience and probably not the right one. So for me, it's you. There's a lot of things to learn and to understand about who God is. I think when you start to build the personal, that's then more the person to think about how they engage with that, knowing what they know already. If that makes sense. Any other thoughts, questions? 